So let's start from the very beginning. When I say the very beginning, I mean it because uh, crowdfunding actually starts uh, um, is, is a form of private uh, um, funding of art. So the very first uh, private investment in art, of course, was uh, mecenatism, and mecenatism was born together with Lorenzo de Medici. We are in Italy still, and uh, apparently, based on uh, data currently available, uh, Lorenzo de Medici spent more than four um, uh, four hundred million uh, dollar, <laughs> which isn't I mean <laughs> is something uh, quite uh, significant, of course. But moving from this, we now got to this this point. So what we mean when we are talking about crowdfunding is uh, some, some kind of uh, funding of project by raising a small amount of money, so micro-investment, from a, a large number of people. And, uh, but actually, this is a, a very broad definition, of course, and it is very broad also because crowdfunding is difficult to define. We have, in fact, uh, we have traced, uh, together with uh, Professor Riccio, four different kinds of crowdfunding. A donation-based crowdfunding, which, of course, is, uh, exists is in place whenever there is no reward. A reward-based crowdfunding, which, of course, exists whenever there is a reward, so there is a consideration, let's say, it's more like the contract style. And then other two models, which are, respectively, lending-based crowdfunding on the one hand, and equity-based equity crowdfunding on the other, which uh, um, are not much used in the art field, so we're not going to focus on them. But in general terms, of course, uh, the lending-based crowdfunding is, um, um, is about the relationship between a, a borrower and a lender, where the crowdfunding platform is a mere intermediary, while on the other end, equity-based crowdfunding uh, requires the acquisition of uh, some kind of shares of the company. So the main uh, models we're going to look at uh, are the first two. And the first two uh, models are actually dis distinguishable based on one single factor, the so-called animus donandi. The thing that while in the first case we do have something which is uh, um, given with some kind of funding which is totally for free, in the second case we have a funding which also takes a reward. However, this reward doesn't necessarily have to be a monetary one. And in fact, a good example of a non-monetary uh, reward is the one offered by uh, the so-called BART crowdfunding platform. This was made actually by an Italian person as well, um, Jessica Tanghetti. And basically this, is a, a, this platform allows uh, artists, art institutions and art professionals to uh, engage and to also um, achieve some kind of funding for some, from some kind of projects. And interestingly, what we have here is that there are unique compensation, such as artworks or exclusive experiences. Of course, this is something which is missing, as we will see in the current legal framework in Italy, because uh, um, what we need here is the fidelization of the public, which is achieved in this way, while, as we see uh, in Italy, this is not the case um, right now. So let's move on now to the current legal framework in Italy. What we have now and what is the most important, what are the most important provisions in order to somehow incent promote crowdfunding initiative is the so-called art bonus decree. This was made uh, in uh, 2014, so the, for the first time there was this provision, which however was provisional, and uh, it was made permanent in 2016. What we have here is a tax credit of 65% of the investment made which is calculated on the 15% of um, the taxable income. And uh, mm, so, mm, of course, this, was a, this is a, a beneficial um, and a very good initiative uh, because, of course, uh, it does promote uh, the um, crowdfunding initiative and does promote this kind of investment. However, on the other hand, what we see is that, um, and, I mean, and of course, in fact, there were some kind of projects which were also promoted in this way. For example, let's think about the Arena de Verona. We have no, 9 million euro raised in this sense. And let's also think about the Aegisium Museum in Turin, where 1,500,000 um, euro were also raised. In total, mm, numbers for 2020 were very good because we also can see that there were 500 million euro in the sole 2020. So this was, of course, great. On the other hand, there are some drawbacks. There are some problems with this provision, 
and the very first one, we're looking also at number, is that the most of the investment takes place only in the northern uh, part of Italy, while in the south there are not many uh, investments. Also, as we will see, there are Mm, there are three, we identified together with the Professor Riccio, three main issues of the provision. So, the first one is the subject scope. It is the most important problem of the provision, I'd say, because uh, as things now stand, what we have is that the art bonus only applies to public art. Of course, it is a very narrow vision of art, because there are some, uh, mm, lots of forms of art uh, and, uh, which are taken off, uh, which are mm, taken out in this way. Let's think about contemporary art, let's think about also performances, let's think about any kind of private artwork. This is not considered. Also, we assist in this sense to what is called the legislative paternalism. This paternalism is uh, very much connected uh, also with the thing that the, is the legislator, as we have seen, who decide what is art and what is not. It is something which reminds us, in some way, <laughs> of the so-called principle of uh, aesthetic neutrality. So, of course, uh, what is uh, normally to avoid for the is uh, that the legislator decide what is art and what is not. And this is not the case, just because he does not have the necessary skills beside this. And also, of course, this would be at the cost and at the sacrifice of lots of artworks, which instead have to be protected. Third limit. The third limit we identified, and the final one actually, is the thing that um, in uh, a nutshell, the art bonus decree does not, is not purpose-based. The donation is uh, addressed to a single uh, initiative, a single intervention, and there is, not a tar mm, there is not a purpose to achieve. This means that on the one hand, it is not possible to achieve that kind of fidelization, which instead would be very great to achieve, and it would allow also people, uh, expats <laughs> like me, <laughs> people who are out of Italy, for example, to identify with a specific purpose, rather than with uh, a single intervention. And on the other hand, having a, a, a specific purpose identified would also allow the, um, a more efficient allocation of sources in the case the financial objective is not reached. This is what happened also in, uh, in the US, as we will see, where it's possible to change the destination of funding in the case the object is not reached, as long as the overall purpose is met. An example, a sad one of a uh, a ban implementation of the art bonus decree uh, is the so-called Real Albergo dei Poveri in Naples. This was made in uh, 1751, and basically this is a, a very important um, building in Naples, and uh, of course it is a part also of the, is this recognized also as a part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. However, what we have here is that for the way the, um, for the, way the project and the, its actual funding is promoted and advertised, let's say, in the art bonus in the art bonus platform because there is a proper platform in order for this investment to be made. It is no fund, no adequate funding was reached. This is very sad because, as you can see from this screenshot, actually what we have here is a, is a contribution of five euros only. And of course, I mean, we cannot say what would have been the outcome in the case uh, there would have been more transparency uh, about, the inform um, about, and, um, about the actual purpose to be met, and uh, there would have been more information. We cannot, we cannot tell, but maybe this would have contributed to create a, a better trust. So, moving from this premise and moving from the Italian um, legal system, let's have a look at some other experience and let's compare them with the Italian system. Let's see to what extent these experiences can be used to build a better model. We are in Europe, we are in France, virtually right now actually, and Le uh, Duallico, pardon me, Eliegon, it's a, actually a regulation which is somehow um, way better than the, the, art, the art bonus decree. This is because uh, while in the art bonus decree, um, the contribution, which is uh, um, subject to the tax relief, can only be made in cash. In this case, it can also be made in kind or in expertise. Also, there is a, a kind of a tax relief in, in case of, perf of performances. And also, um, a certain kind of, uh, of reward-based crowdfunding is also promoted. 
On the other hand, also the, in the UK, more flexible approaches and more flexible models are promoted. An example is the one of the social investment tax relief, providing for a 30% deduction of the investment direct, directed to certain kind of organization. And this is very much used also in the crowdfunding sector. But of course, when we look at the, mm, uh, we, we want to decide and to have a comparative analysis, the most important and the most relevant experience is the US one. And this is because in the US, we assist to the phenomenon of the community foundation. What are community foundation? These are charities which are, um, uh, are basically um, gathering money for local projects and they act as multipliers of funding activities for local projects. So the, uh, the two reference points are the thing that they act as multiplier, they match the investment made from private. And on the other hand, they are very much local. They're very much connected to the local um, environment where they operate. And so in this sense, they also create that kind of trust, which as I was saying, is missing anyways in the Italian model. This is an example, we're in Long Island. And uh, so basically what they financed here is um, on the one end, uh, an artistic center, and on the other also, um, on the other in this case, a museum, but also um, other example which I found, which are interesting are a cinema, uh, funding the, also with the contribution from the, from the foundation. And it is nice because uh, in the US, the model is very engaging and people get constant update of how the project goes on. And also sometimes travel expenses are considered. So it is uh, very much uh, based on the fidelization, this uh, American model, something which I said is missing in the Italian model. However, what we have in Italy also is uh, in, the late, uh, in the latest year is a new model, which is actually uh, somehow inspired to the, um, to the US one. And uh, they are the so-called Cariplo Community Foundation. So basically the Fondazione Cariplo, uh, which is a bank-based one, has, uh, um, has launched this uh, kind of challenge uh, which consists in providing an extraordinary grant of up to 10 million euro to each community foundation, which is able to, to achieve a certain target. So also this Caribou Foundation act as a multiplier of funding. But what we have here, differently from the US model, is that there is a, a pyramidal structure where the community foundation are not acting on their own, but they are, they are acting based on what the Fondazione Cariplo is uh, saying, basically. And also what we have here, as in the art bonus uh, case, is that uh, these kind of experience, uh, um, are somehow, experiences are somehow uh, limited to the northern part of Italy. This is a flexible tool when compared to the art bonus decree. Because of course, as I said, we can also donate, choosing uh, what donate, not only money, but also securities, property, insurance. We can also define how much to get involved. So it's very American in this sense. And uh, um, also donate when it is most convenient for the business. And as I said, this is a kind of investment with, which enables you to choose the purposes. Again, this is something which was missing instead in the, um, in the Italian model, while it is a present in the US model uh, with, the pres with the presence of a so-called variance power. Um, based on this, uh, based on the, la on the latest information available, um, we know that uh, in uh, 2020, more than almost 300 million euro were uh, achieved. And among these, 27% uh, was destined to arts and culture. So this was a great achievement for sure. But again, I said this is uh, somehow confined to the northern part of Italy. An example of a project which was uh, um, financed based on the Cariplo Foundation uh, contribution is the Fondazione Teatro Grande di Brescia. So in this sense, what we assist to is that local character, which also is present as we have seen in the community foundation model of the US, because what we have is that uh, a certain, uh, certain um, shows, uh, certain performances in the theater are um, guaranteed. And so on the, on the one hand, we have uh, um, the implementation and uh, the development of arts and culture, of course. But on the other hand, since these performances are guaranteed also for the benefits of people who otherwise could not benefit from them, is also some kind of social uh, experiment. 
So these are the two parts of the project. So what are our conclusions based uh, on uh, what mm, the current situation? So the analysis of our current situation, as said, reveals uh, the presence of certainly interesting provision of law, uh, such as the art bonus decree, for example, as we've seen. There is, of course, an innovative, uh, and also the, mainly the, the Caribou Foundation, there is, of course, a potential in these legi pieces of legislation. On the other hand, what we have is that there is a too narrow-minded vision of what is uh, art, and in general terms of how the Caribou Foundation model works, and, uh, and also how the art bonus scheme works mainly. So the risk here is to be in a poverty trap, like mouse trap. And um, so in a situation where it is impossible to escape uh, um, from the poverty. And uh, this is because uh, the initial enthusiasm like just ends, comes to an end. And on the other hand, there are no conditions for any further development. So what are um, our suggestions for the future? Based, uh, our suggestions are to look at uh, other models to look at um, the, the US model in particular, the Community Foundation, which I said was somehow implemented also in Italy by Cariplo, but with a different, more vertical and more formal scheme. But what is important is also to implement this model in a way which is actually community based. So in a way which allows the actual participation of the public, of the people contributing, and also of the artists and the community. But not only a participation which is uh, based on mass media or other stuff, a, a, a participation which is also in the same decision making process. And this would be actually the best uh, integrated model ever. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Federica. And uh, we're swiftly moving on uh, to our uh, second. Uh, we have another choral presentation uh, with uh, Elisabetta Lazzaro, who is also our host, one of our hosts today. Uh, and Elisabetta is also going to be uh, presenting with, I believe, uh, Daniel. I'm not sure if Daniel is speaking also. Elisabetta, if it's only you. Uh, and their paper, yes, Daniel is here. I just see him popping up on the screen. Uh, their presentation is entitled Crowd Crowdfunding for Visual Artists, Alternative or Complementary Source of uh, Income. So, Elisabetta and Daniel. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your introduction. Uh, so, um, I, will, uh, I will do the presentation and together with Daniel, uh, we will uh, get your comments uh, and uh, questions uh, later. Uh, can you see my presentation? We did uh, a few no. seconds ago and now it's gone. That's fine, Elisabetta, I guess you just need to go presentation mode and Will be I thought I was already in presentation mode. Uh, it says that I'm presenting to every, everyone. You if are, you can just start the PowerPoint, it will be fine. Um, and it says I'm presenting. It's okay, no. Can you see it? Yes, but we, we can uh, see it, but you have to press on the on the PowerPoint on the slides. You have to put that in in uh, presentation mode. So have the full uh, full page. It's just art. Can you page. see it now? No, it's the same. Uh, um, yes, because I am on full. It's okay. Can you? See? Is it visible? It's perfect there. I can call you. Is it right? It's very, it's, it works in, it's working fine, Elisabetta. Go ahead. Okay, thank you much. Good afternoon. Uh, so this is the one and uh, about crowd. Let's go back to a uh, more specific art market and and to the art market. So this is a, um, a joint project together with uh, Daniel uh, 
um, Daniel Nurgard uh, and uh, is part of uh, an international project, the multi year project uh, uh, funded by the uh, Search Council of Norway, uh, together with the Western uh, Norway University of Life Sciences, uh, uh, other universities uh, in Norway and uh, and Europe about crowdfunding from the artist perspective, uh, spanning also uh, not only Europe but also China and Brazil. So uh, when we talk about crowdfunding for contemporary uh, visual artists, for instance, uh, we refer to uh, these major projects you might be familiar with on your uh, left hand side by Ai Weiwei, the famous uh, dissident uh, Chinese artist. Uh, uh, for which uh, a project of 2017, uh, Good Fences Make a Good Neighbors, uh, which raised almost uh, 100,000 dollars. On your right hand side, uh, you have uh, uh, another major campaign, uh, this time uh, the, the uh, the artist is William Kentridge uh, uh, for a giant installation uh, uh, which took place in Rome in uh, 2016. And by the way, these two uh, art projects were funded uh, through the famous Kickstarter platform. So um, the issue and interest uh, of our research uh, um, are um, threefold. First of all, uh, financing strategies are closely linked to intermediaries or gatekeepers. Um, that is, the art market uh, uh, is typically uh, a for-profit and traditional sector compared to other sectors in the creative industries. Uh, where for uh, their income, uh, uh, visual artists may rely on trade through intermediaries, uh, uh, including galleries, auctions, fairs, and in fewer cases, uh, online platforms. Um, public and charity support, uh, as we have also seen uh, in previous presentations, uh, is rather limited to public projects and museum uh, acquisitions. Another issue and interest of our research uh, is that uh, is about the creative process and financial viability of living artists. Um, we can see that there is an increasing, increasing freedom of media in contemporary visual art, uh, including installations, uh, performances, mixed media, etc. From an economic perspective, uh, therefore, uh, we can uh, see a sort of shift from uh, tangible, permanent, stockable artworks like paintings, uh, sculptures uh, only uh, to also more perishable, uh, temporary life media such as uh, installations, uh, performances, uh, etc. A third major issue and interest of this search is the impact of emerging or already emerged uh, new uh, digital technology, uh, interesting also financial and marketing strategies. So the aims and implications of our research uh, concerning the aims, uh, uh, we are addressing uh, um, the financing patterns of contemporary visual artists. Uh, we aim to test evidence of crowdfunding benefits drawn from uh, theoretical and empirical literature uh, in the case of contemporary visual artists. Uh, uh, if, av if available, but especially on crowdfunding in general. And uh, uh, we aim to um, offer a taxonomy of crowdfunding uh, of visual art projects, in particular in the case of installations and performances that is less traditionally tradable uh, artistic expressions. And uh, to our best knowledge, this is the very first research on crowdfunding applied to the contemporary visual art market. Uh, for what concerns uh, the theoretical and practice uh, implications, uh, 
um, we uh, are interested in uh, uh, the, the, the scope of this research uh, includes uh, the possible uh, substitutional effects and disintermediation in the art market, uh, the impact of crowdfunding on the art market value chain and on the role on commercial intermediaries in artists' income, uh, freedom of artists from keepers, possibly, and but not least, uh, the impact uh, of uh, So, uh, if we can sum up our research questions, we have two major research questions. Uh, the first one is what role for crowdfunding on the art market and uh, dealing uh, uh, from uh, the first question crowdfunding, uh, crowdfunding be considered an alternative or a complementary uh, of uh, funding on the art market uh, so our methodology uh, the research project has start is uh, is a quite a research uh, uh, that I'm uh, presenting to um, is uh, is double uh, the methodological approach aims to test theoretic and empirical evidence from literature and uh, is pretty empirical data driven. You might be familiar with uh, what is crowdfunding. Uh, as we know, crowdfunding has been made possible uh, uh, by uh, the internet and digitization, uh, which uh, substantially reduces uh, transaction costs. Uh, this is a form of sourcing and of alternative complementary finance, which has not originated uh, in the arts and culture sector uh, itself, but uh, in other sectors. And the crowdfunding is typically used to fund a project or a venture rather than uh, structured finance uh, by raising uh, monetary contributions, which are co called pledges, uh, for a given amount from a large number of people. Um, crowdfunding uh, uh, in the arts uh, is increasing also due to the increasing uh, to the sorry to the shrinking of public and private funding. Um, we have two major regions, two major markets uh, interested by fund for the arts, namely the United States uh, and uh, Europe. And um, and um, and uh, uh, the, the age of use for the arts, crowdfunding and reward funding, where in the latter you get some uh, uh, symbolic rewards change uh, of uh, uh, the money pledged. Um, if you look at the literature on the benefits of uh, crowdfunding, and uh, the cultural sector more in general, uh, well, there are two uh, rather uh, recent contributions uh, together with, uh, of myself together with Doug Noonan, uh, um, doing uh, a literature review on uh, uh, the benefits of funding for the arts, culture and creative industries. And, uh, um, the major findings are that uh, um, seemingly uh, the culture and creative industries offer a, a number of direct as well as indirect benefits, uh, uh, including uh, lower transaction costs for fundraising, uh, better outreach uh, of, uh, of, the, of the market, uh, better viability, geographical spread, uh, uh, market research, uh, uh, improved information and lowering of asymmetric information, uh, interaction between the creator and pr prospective backers, uh, uh, democratization of funding, uh, uh, fostering of uh, business skills of artists, uh, community involvement and co-creation with audiences. So, so far, so good. 
so given this, uh, uh, this series of crowdfunding benefits, uh, what we're doing uh, in, in our research, uh, we, through a, a taxonomy uh, that we have built, or that we have at least started to build, we are testing uh, uh, the different um, benefits of crowdfunding uh, uh, through groups of hypotheses. Uh, and then uh, finally listed uh, uh, here in these slides, uh, more specifically, a uh, major question which also titles our presentation today is crowdfunding alternative or complementary funding. Uh, our taxonomy includes uh, some uh, measurements uh, in order to respond to this question, including the proportion of uh, crowdfunding campaigns by so-called institutionalized uh, artists or creators, that is, uh, those leading artists who belong uh, to the uh, established net network of uh, professional art galleries as well as museums. Uh, um, this first uh, hypothesis is further measured by rewards uh, are the art project itself or not. Uh, and then trends in the number of campaigns per year and the trends in uh, money raised. Uh, other hypotheses uh, include uh, the stepping in uh, in crowdfunding of major gatekeepers, uh, major intermediaries of the art market. You might be familiar that uh, uh, the major crowdfunding for the arts uh, Kickstarter um, partnered with Art Basel, uh, the Global Fair, for some years uh, um, in order to raise money for uh, less tradable uh, our projects like installations and performances. Uh, and um, other hypothesis uh, um, is uh, what about a possible role, additional role uh, of Kickstarter, uh, this major crowdfunding platform as a gatekeeper on the art market. Uh, and then we also control for other measures of artistic uh, creators' uh, reputation, uh, the geographical spread. Uh, uh, is it true that through the crowdfunding there is uh, uh, a higher dispersion of uh, people funding uh, the arts? Uh, um, and then other important hypotheses: uh, uh, can, we really, can we really find all these benefits uh, of crowdfunding? on the market for the contemporary visual arts, including uh, uh, better market, market research and prototype testing, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, uh, um, the question about uh, the business skills uh, being increased by artists uh, using crowdfunding in order to fund artistic projects uh, uh, we can measure it through um, observing whether the artist is uh, the uh, campaign creator or instead he or she is assisted or even replaced by organizations, uh, institutions, and even professional fundraisers. Uh, and then also other indicators like the number of campaigns, uh, that is, what is the rate uh, of um, activity of artists using uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, to fund uh, their artistic activities. And last but not least, uh, uh, NI uh, at uh, the level of pledges. Is it really true that crowdfunding is so democratic uh, on the uh, market for the contemporary arts? Um, we uh, collected uh, an original uh, data set uh, in the first part of this year. Um, the main source uh, is Kickstarter, uh, so from uh, the website of Kickstarter, which is, uh, as we know, by far the most important, the most international, the most specialized, uh, with the highest turnover uh, crowdfunding platform 
for the arts. Uh, it is uh, a all or nothing reward uh, crowdfunding platform, meaning that uh, uh, you need, uh, in order to get the money for your art project, uh, um, to uh, fetch the declared goal uh, of your campaign. Otherwise, you will not, not get the money from a uh, platform. And in start mission formation on uh, BIOS and uh, the art projects uh, uh, fundraised for which fundraising was made on general uh, um, we uh, completed all over the world we started launch we focus on all media uh, and performance uh, above um, in town and we also started uh, uh, and we uh, start 70 installation and entries since 2011. So uh, put that into brackets because installation and performance art are two uh smart categories uh used by kickstarter um in there uh, you have to know that kickstarter is not uh, uh completely exhaustive uh in uh, applying uh, its uh, categories and so um installations and performances may also fall uh, into other categories like general art uh, etc but to start with we focus on install performance art. Then we manually cleaned uh, uh, our uh, data set, uh, which was uh, quite as you quite uh, time consuming, um, in order to select true uh, visual contemporary art installations and uh, art pieces differently from uh, uh, infrastructure pay us the money uh, for our museums, uh, for our museum, uh, differently from uh, performing arts like theater, uh, or music, uh, etc. Uh, to control for Kickstarter categorization. And uh, we ended up with this uh, first data set, including 44 art installations, so 63% of the initial number and 25 art performances that is 20 percent of the initial number um, some preliminary results so going back to our hypothesis and taxonomy so basically uh, these are the different measures uh, responding to each uh, uh, these are different uh, groups of measures responding to each hypothesis. So the first four respond uh, to the very core question, is crowdfunding uh, alternative or uh, um, uh, complementary? Uh, well, if you look at the first measurement, uh, uh, this is quite uh, indicative because you can see that uh, uh, about one half percent, uh, one half of the art performances uh, um, are, um, are from uh, institutionalized artist creators. So the institutionalized artist creators use crowdfunding also to fund contemporary art. And the other half is uh, for art performances who don't belong to the uh, professional art gallery circuits and uh, at least national uh, uh, or even uh, more local museums. The situation for artists is uh, uh, rather different because uh, uh, a lower number of institutionalized artists use crowdfunding. 
okay? Uh, uh, then indicators that uh, uh, um, tend uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to bring us uh, to the fact that uh, crowdfunding is less for institutionalized uh, artists or creators is that the rewards uh, are not the art project, almost uh, the, uh, the, uh, the entire number of entries. Uh, you can see other figures, uh, the average uh, uh, amount of the US dollar raised per project. Uh, and also it's interesting to look at uh, the variation and the start and the deviation of these average uh, uh, figures uh, and uh, the campaigns per year. Uh, we can see that uh, Art Basel, this uh, uh, very global important intermediary, is uh, especially present uh, for art performances. Uh, and less for art uh, installations. Uh, and we have these two measures and Kickstarter art project, which is sort of uh, uh, Kickstarter labeling uh, in order to uh, legitimize uh, or increase the reputation of uh, the quality of uh, these art performances and art installations. Uh, and uh, another interesting indicator, are these artist creators uh, still active or disappeared? Uh, the majority of them, but the majority of them are still active. And about the geographical spread, uh, uh, world US, uh, quite important, especially for art installations uh, and uh, uh, campaigns uh, interest uh, major cities. Uh, other preliminary uh, of, uh, uh, of artists, uh, campaign, you can fix measurement. You can see that uh, uh, artists are the creators of the campaign, so this uh, confirms that they have some business skills uh, uh, using crowdfunding. Uh, on the other hand, a minority of them use the so-called uh, Kickstarter collaborators uh, to run campaigns. Uh, uh, campaigns are very extremely rare. And uh, we can see from the number of pledge levels and the types of rewards that these are uh, rather skilled uh, campaigners because Kickstarter usually uh, recommend to keep uh, this number low, uh, especially for uh, newcomers. And then, uh, oops, sorry. And then uh, we can have other measures uh, about uh, if it's a uh, uh, I apologize for jumping in. We're, we're, just, we're not far from the half hour mark, so I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Uh, I'm almost uh, done. And uh, we can see that in terms of uh, uh, communication and co sharing, uh, co creation, sorry, and communication, uh, we don't have really interesting results uh, about crowdfunding for uh, uh, the, uh, the contemporary uh, visual art as well as for democratization. Here you can see some. Uh, uh, first trends in terms of number of campaigns and average uh, amount of money raised. So to conclude, uh, crowdfunding is both alternative and complementary source of funding for contemporary visual artists. We can see some increasing trends in crowdfunding adoption. The artists, creators are skilled campaigners. However, other funding benefits were not confirmed so far uh, in terms of geographical spread, in terms of uh, market research uh, and improved information, and uh, as well as uh, in terms of uh, uh, interaction with backers, co-creation and democratization of funding. So to conclude further research, to expand on our database, also to allow for a comparison with the uh, other sources of funding for leading visual artists. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and sorry for jumping in. This very substantial presentation uh, and uh, very substantial presentation, and I'm sure that um, 
there will be a lot of uh, questions and thoughts that will be coming to uh, during the, our Q&A uh, at the end of this, uh, of this panel. So thank you very much again. Uh, we're continuing uh, with our last panelist of this afternoon, Paul Melton uh, from the Fashion Institute of Technology from SUNY uh, in the US. And Paul has been with us since this morning and I'm happy to give him the floor. All right. Uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, thanks to everyone else uh, for organizing um, and also for bearing with us through today. Um, in the interest of time and also um, in the interest of leaving time for discussion, I'm going to move through this very rapidly. I also know it's, we're at the end of a very long day. Uh, so I'll go through it very briskly um, and we can fill in any details, answer any questions uh, during the discussion. Um, my background, just to give you a little bit uh, of where I'm coming from, I started my life as an academic, as a mathematician, or a student of mathematics and Spanish literature. Um, and it, within math, I focused specifically on numerical methods for partial differential equations, so looking at computational fluid dynamics. Um, and so that was kind of where I got my interest in computational analysis. Uh, but I didn't stay in academia. I left and I worked in research and communications, largely market research, particularly in the telecommunications market, but also in international development, um, which then got me very familiar with sort of the media environment. And that then led me to do a PhD program in media studies, where I focused more specifically on the financialization, on financialization of the art market. And that interest in the financialization of the art market uh, was somewhat a matter of historical coincidence. Um, about the time I was starting my PhD, we had the spectacular convergence of Damien Hirst, Beautiful Inside My Head, Forever Auction at Sotheby's, which was itself purported to be, you know, this event that was going to be a radical restructuring of the market because here was a major artist selling primary work on, you know, through a more secondary market mechanism. That just happened to start on the same night that Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed. Um, and then the second day of the results were the, the sale uh, were also spectacular, right? So the, the impact of the financial market, you know, this sort of global ap financial apocalypse didn't really affect the art market, at least not immediately. Um, and so thinking about then crisis as, you know, kind of disjuncture and a certain sort of revealing of various disjunctures, but also convergences or conjunctures, right? Um, then thinking, I've been thinking a lot lately about the recent sort of crisis that we all find ourselves in. Uh, we, and, and it's both, both its similarities and differences from the previous crisis, not just in terms of cause, but also in terms of the form and particularly its relationship to both the art market and financial markets. And, you know, if we had, you know, Damien Hirst with Beautiful Inside My Head forever being the kind of sort of symbolic moment in the art market during that crisis, then I think, you know, when we look back on the current crisis, which is certainly far from over, um, we'll probably see that this Beeple sale at Christie's uh, was, will be, in a sense, kind of that defining moment, right? And I think the Beeple sale has raised a lot of issues or revived a lot of issues, maybe even just re, um, re-energized a lot of discourse about the digitalization of the art market. Um, and particularly, um, it's the kind of techno-utopic narrative that that takes. Um, but... I, I, I would caution us uh, to sort of over against overstating the novelty of the Beeple sale. I do think it's important. Um, and I think it's important particularly because I think it, it points to a shift in the answer to this question that Melissa Grunland raised is and, and her art historical book on contemporary art and digital culture, uh, which is a very thorough and rigorous accounting. Uh, but she says in the last chapter, it, she, she talks about the post-internet art world infrastructure, which is largely the art market. Um, she says the short and perhaps disappointing answer to whether the art world infrastructure has been fundamentally altered by the internet is not really. And I think that, you know, at the time of her writing, that was a very reasonable and I think many, in many ways viable answer to that question. But now I feel like we've moved from not really to more of a yes, but, right? And so what I want to argue then um, is that what the pandemic has revealed most vividly, among other things, to be sure, um, has been the connection between financial markets and information and communications technology, right? And this is something that these are two things that have been historically intertwined for a long time, which we'll look at. But I think they're uh, 
um, relationship has been disclosed uh, much more spectacularly through this, the last year, right? Through this particular crisis. Um, and so this is what I want to present today as part of a larger project, um, <clears throat> which seeks to explore how social media reshapes relationships to art objects and relationships within the art world according to the logic of finance, and thus to query the possible futures of art market financialization. The central argument of this larger project is that social media financialize the art market slash world, two things that are increasingly collapsed into each other, through twin processes of, on the one hand, informationalization, which is quantitative, calculative, objective, and objectifying, and informationalization on the other hand, and informationalization being a process of ephemeralizing, liquefying, uh, deinstitutionalizing, entrepreneurializing, and celebritizing. Um, and that these two processes then impact or have affected certain shifts in power, knowledge, and value. I mean, not just within the art market, but more broadly. So within the limited scope of this presentation, I'm gonna try to make it even more limited um, in the interest of time. Uh, my goal is to weave together some threads, particularly in social science, but I also wanna to point to some other fields that would be interesting, um, and to build a framework for advancing uh, what's sort of known as the sociocultural approach to studying art market financialization and the deposits and directions for future inquiry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start very briefly with a review of financialization generally, right? So thinking about, you know, the how do we theorize financialization, uh, some of which we heard this morning, so I'll reduce that part. We'll move on to art market financialization and sort of the the primary contours within which I'm working within that literature, and then move on more specifically to the qu this question of how social media financialize the art world. Um, so in terms of financialization studies within social science um, and its adjacent fields, right? So sociology, political theory, political economy, um, there are basically two ways of structuring studies of finance or parsing the myriad work that's been done, particularly in the wake of the, the last financial crisis. And one is in terms of scale, right? So studies of financialization tend to look at the economy, um, as Christine pointed to this morning. So there's a lot of work that's been done on that level, um, particularly thinking about the role of the state in, in promoting financialization, but also thinking about the global politics, right? And thinking about financialization as a political strategy of hegemony. Uh, there are also firm level studies which look particularly at the way in which financial practices restructure organizational culture and organizational operations. Um, and then there are also, you know, on the level, sort of the more micro level, uh, the level of the, the person, right? So studies of financialization that focus more on the, the individual or the household. And these studies then also sort of, I mean, that, that sort of, or I guess, scalar, right, parsing, could also be related to the other way uh, studies of financialization have been parsed between the more market-oriented uh, uh, studies, right, or the more market-oriented approach, which really looks at market structures and dynamics, or the more socio-cultural socio approach, uh, which is, I mean, in a sense is basically, you know, are we looking at things that are more economic or political or things that are more social and cultural? Um, but again, I don't think these approaches are mutually exclusive. They're often quite complementary and they're often blended together. Um, one of the things that's particularly interesting, you know, when we look at that broad body of research is that there are certain themes that run all the way through it, right? And two that I'm most interested in are one, quantification, right? So the way in which metrics become very much a part of financialization, and this is, you know, on the one, uh, very much tied to this concept of informationalization, right? So when we think about the way in which economic measures produce the economy, um, as Timothy Mitchell has argued, but particularly the way in which the, share price, right, becomes the primary metric for determining shareholder value, which then becomes for the, the logic of, within the firm level, the logic of managerial practice, right? And so then there's a way in which I think particularly at the firm level, we get a nice kind of overlap of these market-oriented and um, sociocultural approaches. Uh, but particularly, and this is, this is a quote from Van, uh, van der Zwan's Making Sense of Financialization, is that shareholder value operates as a discursive construct, a language that operates independently of a firm's performance, right? As it discloses the decoupling of the reality of a firm's performance uh, from the representation of its valuation. Um, so this question of metrics is tied very much to questions of representation, questions of value. 
But when we think about the sociocultural approach, uh, particularly within the, the studies of financialization at the level of the person, there's a lot of rich overlap with neo studies of neoliberalism and particularly the subject of financialization, right? And the way in which financialization produces a new form of subjectivity that's specific to this latest phase of capitalism. Um, and there, um, there we go. Uh, again, quoting from Zander, uh, Van der Zwan, what sets the investing subject apart from prior forms of identification is his, and she's very specific in using the, the masculine pronouns because that's the way this discourse is often articulated, his uh, individual nature, he acts in his own, uh, on his own for the benefit of himself and of his household, right? So um, there's a particular kind of subjectivity, right? And this is what I, I mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning in terms of the idea of identity being a question of capital that is perpetually invested and, and revalorized, right? Um, but there again, there's, I mean, the overlap with studies of neoliberalism, even though they are two distinct phenomena, um, is present at all of these levels of analysis. Uh, but one of the things, particularly, again, in the sociocultural uh, realm that I find interesting is the way in which particular cultural forms serve to disseminate the logic of finance, right? And, you know, I think within the history of television, again, drawing on my background in media studies, you know, we can look at the way in which game shows or reality television inscribe, right, or reify the logic of finance, whether it's through, you know, this idea of knowing the market by being able to price things correctly, like you get in the, the price is right, or whether it's a question of, uh, reframing or transforming the relationship between people and their dwellings from, you know, the kind of sentimental effective home to the speculative investment, right? The, the idea that you buy a house not to live in, but to live in while it accrues value and so you can flip it and then realize that value. Um, so that's kind of the brief overview of the, how this work is situated within the broader field of financialization. Um, and so then moving on to financialization of the art market, you know, again, I think when we deal with the art market, the, the separation between market oriented approaches that are more, you know, political economic and the sociocultural approaches, um, that that parsing gets even harder to to cleave, I guess, or to, to, to defend because these things do overlap quite, um, quite significantly. Um, Kostler and Valve Choices, I mean, arguably canonical piece on um, financialization of the art market, which has been referenced in several of the presentations here to four, um, looks at, I mean, is much one on the one hand, much more market oriented, but it it parses or structures the the historical development of financialization in the three distinct sort of epochs, right? And points to financialization of the art market is really taking off in the 60s, right? And here again, this is where and as opposed to the use of art as a financial asset, i.e. a store of value, financialization refers to the um, the predominance, right, of financial logics over other logics. So that takes off in the 60s, largely through one media representation, um, you know, and, and Kostner and Veltois always point to a lot of discourse in popular press about the investment value of art. Um, I have a collection of art investment manuals from that period up to the present over on that shelf. Um, similarly, um, but then they also point out how the development of this particular mechanism of the price index, which you see over here on the left hand of the slide, was particularly important for rendering art um, intelligible to the financial community. Um, the next wave of financialization then sort of builds on that development of the price index and extends it to art market information services, which is what we've heard about before. And there you can see one of the early prospectuses from ArtNet in the center. And then this, the last wave of art market financialization uh, that they identify starts, you know, in uh, around the 2000s with art investment funds, which is something we've we've heard about before now, uh, or you know, today. What they do say, and I think is particularly important, and this ties into some of what Christine had presented this morning, is that this this last wave of art market financialization is characterized by, and I'm quoting them, mimetic isomorphism. Um, as role models and organizational blueprints from the world of finance have been adopted by the art investment community, which has increased its legitimacy, right? And this is where, if you go through and look at prospectuses from the Fine Art Fund Group or from Fernwood Investments or any of these other art investment funds, you'll find that they're formatted very much like 
S1s, right? So, you know, the documents that the prospectuses that public company that companies will I was going to say they're not yet public when they do an S1, but companies that want to go public will produce a prospectus. And that formatting is used to present art as an investment opportunity. Uh, what they do highlight, and this is something that's again come up a bit today, is that this financialization at the time of their writing, just 2012, remains incomplete. And it does so in their account largely for structural reasons, right? The lack of uh, liquidity, the lack of intermediaries to ensure continuous trading that would help generate that liquidity, um, and then also the lack of shared or stable standards of value. And I think it's that incompleteness that then creates the opportunity for socio socio-cultural approaches of financialization of the art market to really contribute. Um, and this is where uh, both Ivanova and Taylor have written about the derivative logic of uh, contemporary art um and you know so i'll start with Ivanova and then make a few comments about taylor um and Ivanova set presents and i quote contemporary art as a semantic operation grounded in the logics of derivative markets in which the derivative is divorced from its underlying asset right and that that divorce you know takes place on the basis of de-skilling right so when we think about you know the development of art historically through the 20th century so there's the de-skilling of the of artistic practice conceptualism right in which you know the it's the idea rather than the the object but also circulation right so the expansion of the art world's infrastructure um particularly as a commu it's communicative infrastructure it's right? so if on the one hand art market information is sort of the the form of circulation that helps in the fine in the market oriented approach the sort of criticism in this expanding um set of biennials exhibitions etc um is what's important in terms of circulation and for the socio uh, cultural approach and as she says contemporary art functions in a manner analogous to financial derivatives art at, is art's reflexive processes propel the circulation of cultural and financial value in artwork derivatives towards an autonomous and self-expanding form by continually extracting value from other domains amplifying it through the through circulation and distributing it between select market participants and this particular dynamic of extraction is something that i think we could in our historical sense think about in terms of the rise of research-based practice right um or even you know appropriation art etc um and taylor similarly reinforces the kind of linguistic notion here right and and highlights this as being specific to financial capitalism in that wealth is generated by the circulation of signs grounded in a seemingly endless play of signs. As this new form of capitalism expands, the production of tangible goods is increasingly displaced by the invention of intangible products designed for speculative investments. And both Taylor and, and Ivanova are critical of what this does to art. I mean, Taylor's very moralistic in saying that art has lost its way. Ivanova is, I think, a little more nuanced, or, or at least maybe uncritically romantic, um, in that she says that you know the these the derivative logic of contemporary art, in a sense, kind of neutralizes its critical gestures. And I think this is something that Hal Foster has taken up more recently, particularly around the work of like Hugo Steril, um, and some other artists. One of my concerns with this literature um, is the depth of historicization, right? So I think art historically, there's plenty of room as we saw this morning with Professor Cross presentation to more rigorously uh, engage with art history. But there's also, I think, a, a lack of historicization in terms of the, act, the history of finance and particularly the shift in the moral valence of finance. And this is where historians and or sociologists of finance like Alex Prada, Mary Eke de Good, um have built on the work of sociologists like viviana zelizer who's done phenomenal work about the way in which life insurance you know as a financial product was re-signified from being a morally offensive product right to a um from being a morally offensive product to being um, an ethical obligation or a noble uh, gesture towards taking care of one's loved ones but i think there's also a need to historicize more deeply the role of technology and particularly the category of information which is something that emerges only in the mid 20th century right so information theory which is the basis for you know all of our computer systems and information and communications technology only comes about with claude shannon's mathematical model of communication right so so when we so uncritically you know use this notion of information to talk about things like transparency etc then i think we're we're risking a lack of precision in our analysis 
Um, so then for the last part, um, you know, I, and I think this is where, um, actually I, I, this slide just reminded me, one of the things I, th I think in terms of that, um, the need to historicize uh, about technologically is also to see how to the technology that is part of financialization allows works that are not contemporary, particularly the Salvatore Mundi. I think there's a very strong argument to be made that what Christie's did with the Salvatore Mundi was to turn it into a work of contemporary art by subjecting it to the kind of informational circulation that characterizes uh, contemporary art. Um, but in terms of um, the this this sort of work, right? I think part of the the problem. Or, or, or I think where this limit comes from, right, where this sort of lack of historicization or the need for deeper historicization comes from is largely a product of the framing of uh, financialization of the art world in terms of derivatives. And that's where, um, you know, I, and I don't fault any of the scholars working on this. I think the, the literature regarding derivatives is particularly important. It's been particularly rich, um, but it tends to start with the 70s and ignore everything that came before it. Um, and that is something that is repeated in, in textbooks of economic finance. Um, and so there's been some interesting work done. Ernst Young Weber, for example, has a short history of derivative security markets, uh, when I think he maybe goes too far in the other direction and traces derivative products back to Mesopotamia. Uh, but there is a strong argument to me made that even if the word derivative was not used until the late 70s or early 80s, uh, that these financial products, right, as speculative contracts have a much longer history, right, that needs to be taken into account so that we can be more precise with what's new and different now. And to that end then, I would, I think where, where, what I would like to put advance for the sociocultural approach to financialization of the art market is that you know we think not just in terms of the logic of derivative, but think in terms of the epistemization of economic transactions, right? And this comes from a 2000, and I think it was an article by Karn Norsatina and Alex Prada, where they talk about the epistemization of economic transactions as referring to a situation where these transactions rely on and are interstitched with multiple an an uh, analysis processes or analytic processes and systems in a variety of ways. Um, and it's work inscribed in, in and constitutive, sorry, there's too many typos on the slide, and constitutive of economic objects as relevant to the practical activities of their economic agents, right? And so what they're talking about here is not just that, you know, there's theory that then gets uh, practice, right? But it's actually theory that's generated in practice or information that's generated in, in practice. Um, and so one of the examples, I think, of how productive this approach to thinking about financializing the art market can be comes from another sociologist of finance, um, um, Juan Pablo Pardo Guerra, um, and his analysis of auction catalogs. Um, and I was thinking about this in the, the earlier presentations this afternoon. Um, when we look at auction catalogs as financializing devices, right, that operate, as he says, at different interlocking levels, intersecting economic, legal, and aesthetic discourses, and configuring respectively boundaries of price, authenticity, and worth. Um, and he talks about how they configure a double temporality, which I think also points us to you know, one of the distinguishing features of financial products, particularly uh, derivatives, is their temporality. And I think that temporality is something that is already operative in these, as, as he argues, in these auction catalogs. So then in, in conclusion, he says, the auction catalog acts as a scoping device a learned mechanism for tracing the trajectory of a cultural object from its past origins to its marketable futures, right? So in that analysis of the auction catalog, then I think we see quite clearly how financialization occurs, even in something that is analog, right? So a digitalization isn't, you know, a, a necessary condition for financialization, but it does do interesting things to that process of financialization. Um, and I take to heart, you know, very deeply his, his concluding comment too, that future students of art markets must not lose sight of the actuarial role of materialities of the critical but often unacknowledged place occupied by mundane devices in creating numerous forms of aesthetic and economic calculation. Um, he's gone on then to work more recently with the automation evaluation that takes place in financial markets and to highlight the way in which standardizing information is critical to automating valuation. And so what I want to do to build on that is to think then about the, the sort of, um, again, the, the mundane device that creates numerous forms of aesthetic and economic calculation, which is social media. 
Um, and this is where drawing on Adam Arvidsson's work, um, Arvidsson again, you know, builds on the logic of the derivative to argue about, to argue that Facebook packages users as commodified advertising agency and builds on, and in so doing builds on and develops the logic of the, of the derivative and consequently, Facebook is, and I'm quoting from Arvidsson here, uh, one of the most important contemporary manifestations or materializations, excuse me, of this new financial paradigm, potentially making it an important instrument for biopolitical governance of the social on the part of financial capital. And so what he's looking at particularly is the algorithms that Facebook uses to value user attention, right? And the way in which the social graph creates the kind of abstract calculative space that is very much the same abstract calculative space as that of financial derivatives, right? And so, um, and he, so he looks at that on the one hand, so thinking about that kind of logic that, that inheres in that calculation, right? And the way that it reassembles things um, that may not have any sort of ontological basis in reality, right? So there, there are things that fit together in this space that don't actually coincide so much in you know, physical reality. But his, his argument is not just you know, technological, right, or logical, but it's also genealogical, right? And so he looks at specifically, and this is where his work on social media intersects with his work on branding, which I would highly recommend to anybody who's interested. I think it's one of the most <laughs> thorough and provocative accounts of branding, um, and particularly branding as social media, um, that this is tied up in the history of market research, right? And so the that the market research techniques that developed over the 20th century, which if you're looking for a more sort of entertaining introduction to that, um, Adam Curtis's The Century of the Self is a great place to start. But there's a way in which the, the history of market research, right, develops these kind of logics, right? And this application of, of probabilistic reasoning or uh, computational reason and its application to, to advertising um, and to valuing adver advertising, which gets taken up also in financial markets as well. The issue, the, the one issue I would have with um, Arvidsson is that this account, right, this focus on the derivative logic of social media focuses on the product, right, that is the, the product of the audience that's being sold in a way that obscures the platform, right, the exchange on which, on which this product is actually being traded. And so to complement that account of social media as a vector of financialization, then I think we also need to turn to Karin Norsatina's work on the specific differences of financial markets relative to the place-based uh, network and consumer markets that came before, right? Um, and she, she highlights the fact that financial markets are uniquely scopic in their construction and operation. Um, and this is, again, the Bloomberg terminal, terminal is in many ways the apotheosis of that, but as Alex Prada in Framing Finance has traced, that technological history, right, that kind of scopic market existed before, uh, particularly through the, the stop ticker, right, using telegraph technology. And so um, this scopic quality... Oh, yeah, I feel terrible. But again, it's almost half an hour. So just just to oh, let you know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm literally... sorry. I apologize. This is... Oh, no, no, no. So anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I was trying to get through it faster. Anyway, so I think that we need to think about this scopic quality and particularly what it um, was uh, the way that the way then that we can think about Instagram as a vector of financialization within the art market. And I think that's something, these are directions that, that I'm pursuing that. Uh, but what I wanna close with then, um, if I can have just like maybe one more minute, um, is you know writing on the pandemic's impact on the art market in May, 2020, Bloomberg's James Tarmy noted how, for now, no one has come up with a competing and compelling alternative to the crowd, though several have tried. The crowd in question is not the crowd of social media, but the embodied mass uh, following the art market's cyclical calendars of fairs, biennials, and exhibitions. And so how do we account for that difference? I think one explanation is the idea of bodied, embodied co-presence, uh, which is something uh, Patrick Kearney has talked about in Touch. But I think the other thing that that points to is that these market structures are not just places of exchange, but in a sense, they're rituals that bind a community together. And this is where I think um, 
Byung Chul Han's work on the disappearance of rituals is something we could think about in relationship to communica communication studies and a ritual model of communication. And ultimately, I think aesthetic philosophy is something that we should think about in, as part of this discussion. Again, sorry that went over, uh, but there we go. Thank you so very much, uh, Paul, and I apologize. It's, mm. it's, it's terrible to interrupt, and it's even terribler when when we're online. I think it, it's just, it's it's awful. Well, I, without like, the ability to look out and see, like you know, a card going up, you know, it's it's hard. And for for those of us who are following us on YouTube, I just want to say that when we're using Google Meet and presenting, the only thing that the presenter sees is the screen, so it's it, it's it's very alien. It's it's very difficult. Uh, I want to thank our three panelists again for three very, very thorough uh, papers, um, which has uh, really sparked many, many questions uh, and, and thoughts for myself. And I, um, uh, again, would also thank you for uh, uh, accepting this online format, okay, which, which, is, which is draining uh, in so many ways. And uh, there's a lot of echoes between your papers. And maybe I would want to start with just one general question for the three of you uh, and the four of you, because Daniel is here. Uh, and maybe just one question each, uh, and then we can obviously open up uh, the floor to, to everybody. Uh, I guess the, the one question that I would have uh, for, for the, the three um, papers has to do with, and I'm going to dig up uh, a little bit old fashioned Schumpeter here and uh, Paul alluded to him with his disruptive, uh, so the disruptiveness or the disruptive nature or not of the internet uh, uh, in art markets in particular and crowdfunding and Instagram that Paul was talking about. So I would like to have maybe a little more of your thoughts on, on, on the disruptive nature or not or how disruptive it is or is it sort of still more of the same, but on a different, uh, on a different platform. Uh, That's my first general question. And then I have one, just one, I have many, but I decided to choose one uh, question. One for, for Federica, uh, when uh, at the beginning of your paper, Federica, you said that, uh, so you, you mentioned the decree from 2014, and you said that this decree, which uh, is basically aimed at public uh, places, public uh, works, and uh, I was wondering, um, how is how are the works of art, the the, uh, the heritage sites that are funded? Is there a commission? Uh, is there a panel? So could you tell us more a little bit about how uh, who decides basically? You know who who is the uh, so that's my my question for Federica amongst many questions. I also have one question for uh, Elisabetta and um, Daniel. It's fascinating the distinction that you make between uh, alternative and complementary um, uh, financing uh, for uh, crowdfunding. And I was also very, very interested in uh, this new approach that you have to crowdfunding as a marketing uh, technique. And I, I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on, on the map marketing aspect of, of crowdfunding, which is not necessarily the way it's put forward uh, uh, in, in general. So thank you very much for that. And Paul, uh, I have a bunch of questions, uh, obviously, but uh, it's more of my feel. Also, I, I was I was thought it was very interesting that you made the distinction between financiers and actuaries, which definitely is something that comes back again and again. Uh, very interested in what you said about derivatives being divorced from the underlying matrix, okay, which is not exactly what you would expect from a derivative, which needs a root. Uh, so I thought it was, that was very, very interesting. And my question, uh, so the one that I chose, and we can continue uh, with all of you, obviously, in the chat and further on is, has to do with short-termism. Um, it is, again, for, for the three of you, is it, is short-termism has been also seen as a sort of pathology of financialization, it's everything now. Uh, and that is definitely counter or goes counter to investment, the very nature of what we think is uh, investment. So I was wondering what, what your thoughts were on, on, on that, or if again, it was something that, that needed to be qualified. And thank you again, and apologies again to Elisabetta and Paul for having interrupted. No, my apologies for going over time.
Well, I was going to say, I guess just quickly then, with the question of short termism, I think one of the, so the temporality of finance is super interesting, right? And so we think about particularly how that relates to valuation. And I think this is something we saw before too, um, is there, there's a way in which I think particularly valuation, right? So when you think about discounted cash flows as being a valuation technique that brings the future into the present, right? So there, there's a way in which the future is, as much as we talk about the future in speculation, it's always being collapsed back into the present. Um, and it's interesting to think about how that mode of valuation within financial markets um, relates to the value of art, right? So when you think about art being something, if something that is going to, and I think this is something Nizan, you mentioned uh, earlier, is that you see like some of these, these people who are fetching really high prices right now, who are not going to be art, art historically important, right? In the least. Um, so there, there are two different, I mean, I think that, and I think that one of the, the issue, maybe one of the fundamental sort of barriers then for the financialization of the art market is reconciling these very fundamental, fundamentally different uh, forms of valuation. And they're fundamentally different in their relationship to time, right? Because that historical legacy, right? The art historical legacy can't be brought into the present. In that sort of, in, in, in the same way, right? Sort of calculatively that, you know, projecting a cash flow from, you know, say a rental property, right, could be brought into the present, right, to value the real estate. Uh, I, I don't know if that can take your question, but yeah. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to respond to that because the other panelists haven't uh, spoken to one another, but I, I can do it later, like pick up on Paul's thread and I guess it's a question to the moderator. Can I respond to Paul? Sure, if if, if the panel agrees. Um, because I was going to ask you um, uh, in in a very American way, um, uh, um, you know, because you were in your present. I loved your presentation. Thank you so much, by the way. But I was going to ask you, like, okay, so what's at stake? But now I'm getting a picture of it. And the other thing that I was going to say to you is that you should try and replace your term, the crowd, with the public. Because that's then you have that kind of stake where if you're bringing in these works that are not going to matter for the future into the museum today, you're actually, so, so that's where, you know, for me, the, the, the more political aspect of it is like, you're doing it at the expense of the public, you're allowing wealthy people to leverage at the expense of the public, but we can evaluate actually, because we have art history and we have disciplines that are dedicated to criticism. So, and we have peer review and we have all these systems that are not being used. And um, so, you know, I would argue because the other half of me is an art historian that we absolutely have ways to discuss what art matters for the future. And that there's a giant discrepancy between the kind of art that, that has traction on the market and art that might have significance for the future. Um, and if you replace the notion of the crowd with the notion of the public and politicize this crowd, um, you know, I, I think Paul DiMaggio has this very interesting discussion of, of, the, of the public of museums as including the potential public that is not actually coming to, to museums now. And all these protests that we see and criticism of the museums as um, you know, um, perpetuating white supremacy are actually, the stakes are the kind of public that is not showing up right now. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, if, yeah, well, if I could just quickly respond to that, but I wanted to take that actually into this the question of crowdfunding, right? Because I'm very that was James Charmy's word about crowd, right? And I think it's an interesting distinction to make between crowds and publics. Arvidson incidentally has uh, an article on brand publics where he looks at the difference between brand communities and brand publics. Um, and so thinking about the question of public, right, and what constitutes a public versus a crowd, I'm interested to hear from the people working on uh, on crowdsourcing, right, or crowdfunding how this notion of crowdfunding relates to a concept of the public, right? And, and particularly when we talk about funding the arts, to what degree does crowdfunding 
right? If on the one hand it it, it presents as, as democratic, right, or democratizing, to what degree does it actually participate in a further erosion of the state, right? So where people are asking for taxes to be cut, right, or refusing to pay taxes, but they will go put money in people's GoFundMe's or you know, etc. So, I. I'm curious as to what you see, I mean, particularly when we're thinking about cultural heritage, right? So what are the politics of crowdfunding as a replacement for state support? But in fact, we, we are showing that it's not a replacement for mm. uh, the, the contemporary arts. Uh, it's an enrichment of modalities uh, to fund uh, contemporary art. I don't know if, Daniel, you want to add something else? Uh, let me see. No, uh, I, I think uh, I think that's spot on. Uh, it, it's not really. And, and I thought I, I thought it was a good. Uh, it was a good quote by Federici, I think, when you you quoted to who it was who said that uh, digitalization and, and it ties with your your uh, comments, Christine, on the Schumpeterian expectations of of digitalization, whether it's going to disrupt everything, and I think. Uh, from what we can say, yes, it does have an effect to, for some parts of it, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a a paradigm shift or a, a like it, it doesn't turn things, you know, upside down in any way. And this ties very much with my own research from from music business and music industries, and which has been the uh, the expectations for you know, two decades now uh, that everything's going to change, and and I think. Uh, a lot of my own research and, and you know, building on the research of David Haskenhaus and, and, and others, uh, you know, there's a lot of continuations within the digital cultural industries or cultural arts uh, business. And we have to acknowledge that at the same time as things do change. I, I don't know if the panelists have questions, if you have questions amongst yourselves that you would want to maybe share. Okay, I, I, have, I have a question for Federica. Yeah. I have yeah. a question for Federica. Uh, Federica, are you planning to do some comparative analysis uh, with other countries or at least at European level? Uh, because you know that uh, uh, crowdfunding uh, in Europe has been the object of uh, uh, some tentative uh, uh, harmonization. I, I don't know if you are uh, aware about that. Uh, well, actually, the thanks for your query. <laughs> so, actually, the main focus was uh, a comparison between Italy and the US rather than other countries in the EU. Was a uh, but we just had a look at other country, but a very preliminary one. And um, yeah, I know about the initiative, but that's why since there is a something, uh, I mean, we would, we would open the Pandora box. <laughs> so I was, uh, we're not focusing on this uh, in uh, the, for this specific search. But yes, this is a very good point actually. And also there is a project of organization at the level of community foundation in the EU. So these other would, would be another interesting point to look at. And if I can take the chance to know also to reply to some of the queries uh, you were asking before, shall I? Let's see. Okay. Uh, so basically, for uh, for what concern the um, the way you were asking about the way the art models work in Italy, and uh, so what we have uh, is that there is no process at all, basically, because what we have uh, is that the good in order to to be, um, to, to, I mean, in order to, to be considered in the list of uh, goods which are also subject to this tax relief, is, uh, is to be a cultural good, a cultural public good. And there is a very narrow list which is already provided, uh, I mean, uh, from the legislator. So there is nothing new, I mean, nothing to be properly decided. And uh, afterwards, uh, what we, also what we have is that only um, intervention of a restoration are possible. The only thing which is a bit more interactive is that, of course, um, what we have in Italy is that you have a, an art bond, you have an online portal. And so, in fact, uh, on that portal are already, on that platform, are already uploaded all the information about the selected cultural good, but I'm sure you can also add additional one as, as long as they are considered to be cultural good according to Italian uh, law. 
And uh, uh, so you can see that everyone can just give uh, its money to that. And yeah, so this is more or less how it works. I had a question. In your uh, research on the U.S., uh, have you looked at sort of the the so thinking about community organizations in the U.S.? I mean, one of the one of the issue one of the things I was interested in because I don't know about how this works in Italy is in the U.S. Things are very segregated class wise, right? We don't talk about class, but if you look at neighborhoods or communities, this is part of the problem with our educational system because it's funded by property taxes, which are based on property values, right? So for example, in New York, like in, in the city, if you look at community organizations that have funded public projects, such as park renovations, right? Like the park conservancies, those only exist in areas with high property values, right? So in terms of the kind of democratizing- Yeah, yeah. These communicate, yeah, so that, I mean, that that's, so I'm just yeah. curious like, how, what the, that, yeah. yeah, no, this is actually a very good point. I mean, what I noticed is that in the US, by the way, there are, I mean, this is, of course, a good point from a, an external perspective. I noticed that, by the way, there were lots of community foundations. I mean, of course, in the US, it's, very, it's a very big area, but there are 900. And uh, in Italy, we are, I mean, what I was looking at was uh, the situation in Italy. In Italy, we have the very same thing with the Caribbean Foundation and with the Art Bonus. Because as I was telling you, the, we have this gap south north. So of course I can imagine, and I, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure this uh, very same pattern happens also in the US. And what uh, I was also considering uh, while talking with a friend of mine who is an artist actually, so he, he took part. I mean, um, he, he, he somehow took part to some of this project. He was telling me that actually it's very difficult for your project to, to, to be given any kind of grant. It's uh, very much about uh, people knowing each other and knowing each other. And it's very, um, so I can totally see the point that you are raising. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Paul, for your question. I see that Daniel raised uh, his hand. So. Um... Uh Yes, uh, I, I thought that was that was just uh, a quick comment which I posted in in the um, in the uh, chat on uh, this article that uh, kind of suggests that we uh, the very discussions on crowdfunding has a potential negative effect on uh, the public uh, support for the arts or the, the financing of the art because it means that politicians can say that we no longer need to have the same responsibility and the crowd can now take take over. Which is, of course, uh, a potential uh, threat. Yes. If 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 I could also also say uh, one more thing, which is which is the the democratization uh, part, which me and Elisabetta has also been uh, looking at and and very much interested in, and I think. There are a few aspects. One is tied to whether it has uh, non-institutionalized uh, artists, whether it fills a gap on on artists who can't get funding through traditionally traditional intermediaries, which is one interesting part. The other one ties with uh, how the audience or or the crowd or the public can engage with with the arts and which ties a little bit with discussions on co-creation and, and so forth. And one of the things that we've been looking at uh, on that particular uh, variable has been to, to, to count comments and, and, and the degree of intercommunication on, on the platforms. And this was probably one of the things that I found most you know, uh, striking and, and, and quite surprising actually, which was that within the, the category that I was looking at, installations, there were very few comments. There was very little interaction. There was very little uh, involvement by by funders. Uh, so they were willing to spend quite a lot of money uh, on the project, but they didn't really interact in any meaningful meaningful way. Uh, the interaction that we did see is very often uh, concerning a lack of rewards, or they they were they they were delayed uh, delays in, in rewards. So to a certain extent, you can see that one of, one of the things that a lot of literature on crowdfunding is expressing and highlighting, which is democratization and, and, uh, and co-creation or involvement, we don't really see 
you know, huge evidence uh, of this, which I find you know, interesting. Thank you very much. I'm 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 reading the the the, the questions on the YouTube our YouTube channel, and I see that there's a, a question that I I was thinking maybe we can wrap up our session with with that general and very topical question. It's from Andrei, um, who's asking. So I'm reading his question. Um, so he says, for all speakers, pandemic seemed to enhance digitalization mechanisms greatly. Did this? And will this bring also significant changes for art markets, financing, pricing, presentations, et cetera? So basically the effect of the pandemic, if I, we're still in it to a certain extent, um, uh, hopefully this is almost the end. Uh, so I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts on, uh, on that. Elizabeth, are you, uh, <laughs> we, this is one of the things that we were actually looking at and, and the graphs that that, uh, that Elizabeth showed in, in the very end, if we had had a little bit more time, we could have, uh, you know, dived into it, but, but it, we should probably, and it's a really good question, uh, because we should have been able to see an increase uh, in the end, uh, however, we don't really, but I think uh, that probably has to do, you know, you have to tie in at least two things with this. One is that uh, the pandemic has led to the need for alternative financing. On the other hand, the pandemic has also shut down everything. So the, you know, the places where you do perform and where you do make have also been shut down. So, so we may not see, we may see a lagging effect of this in a few years. So uh, it's, I would, I would assume that it's a bit, it's a bit too, too early to pass judgment on whether there is a true effect on the pandemic. Yeah, uh, uh, let me add that to some extent, to some extent, uh, uh, installations and in, in, in particular performances uh, are closer to the performing arts, uh, to live arts uh, because they depend, uh, uh, they depend crucially on the audience they cannot exist without the audience uh, and therefore uh, um, 2020 is not a year uh, I mean it's an outlier clearly uh, so we need to wait and see what is going on uh, since the reopening but uh, uh, from the few data that we have uh, since the uh, a partial reopening, uh, well, not really in France, uh, in fact, we are still online, uh, but we can see there is uh, some, uh, uh, is this a short term effect? Is this uh, a medium or longer, longer term effect? Uh, we don't have uh, the crystal ball, uh, unfortunately, uh, what we can we could observe in uh, including also 2021 uh, campaigns uh, is that there is uh, activity back uh, with uh, with the responses from uh, response uh, from the crowd in our case is the crowd uh, let's wait uh, what uh, what will uh, happen otherwise yeah i think it's going to be very difficult to 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 make any sort of prognosis because it's so complicated, right? And I think because the market itself is very, I mean, if you look at what happened to the commercial, like contemporary art world, right? Um, on the one hand, you had people doing online sales rooms, but you also had all of the mega galleries instantly putting outposts in the Hamptons and West Palm Beach, right? So in places where they could actually, you know, there was, they didn't, the, the blue chip art market, like contemporary art market did not go fully digital. Um, and, you know, here in, in New York and people were desperate, um, to resume seeing art in person. So I think there is, but that might just be a certain cleavage in value, right? And this is where I think we, we tend to think of the art market as being, you know, this sort of monolithic whole and art publics as being this kind of monolithic whole. But I think what we might see, much like we've seen politically is like an increased sort of polarization, fragmentation, um, and that that so the other thing oh the, and the other thing I think that's gonna the, 
depend on that is also the way in which the real estate market reshuffles, particularly here in New York, where there's a lot of speculation that commercial real estate prices particularly are going to be radically restructured. Um, and I guess actually they already have. Um, but there's a, a there's some hope that the they that a lot of commercial space will be evacuated and then made available to artists so that we'll see something akin to like Soho in the 70s. I think that, yeah, Nizan and then Federica raised their hands. So just, just to respond to that um, and continuing with all the information one has that one cannot disclose where one gets, the art market, the art market, um, the high end art market never stopped. The galleries never stopped. Everybody continued illegally to do everything that they were doing because they really think they are exceptional. And in many ways they are because the, the evidence is just right there. They kept on doing business um, and flying and meeting and all of that. So. Federica and maybe Daniel also has uh, some comments on that. Yep. So I just wanted to add in the topic that also from the few data that I um, collected on this, what we see that is either both the art bonus in Italy, at least the art bonus on the one end and also the Caribou Foundation did not see a decrease uh, in the amount of money collected. Neither an increase, but neither a decrease. And uh, another consideration is that what maybe can, uh, I mean, one of the effect which uh, must, have, which might have occur in the long, in the short term is that those organizations, those foundations, for example, the US ones, which have different uh, um, distinction and different targets, so also social targets, maybe in this period, yes, I mean, uh, the kind of, uh, they were allocated sources more to this kind of social uh, projects than to a promotion of art and culture, also because uh, people were more in need uh, for help uh, on this side. I think I'm going to thank you again. Uh, and um, je vais vous dire merci. I just wanted to say a word in French <laughs> because uh, some of you are in Paris or in France. Merci beaucoup uh, pour toutes vos présentations. And I want to hand the, the baton back to Benedict and, and Natalie and Elisabetta who maybe want to say a few more things and, and um, à demain. Yes, the uh, technician team is going to wrap up the live. So this is the, the last two, three minutes to say one last word publicly to the whole live YouTube. Uh, very much for, uh, for carrying uh, this session. It was hard because it was uh, the end of the day. And uh, thank you for uh, enduring in uh, fairly doing uh, your job. Yeah. I think we have to thank all the viewers if they've managed to stay. That's wonderful. And we look forward to seeing them tomorrow. Yes, I that it was really a great day. And thank you, Benedict, for all this organization. Merci <laughs> beaucoup. Absolutely. And also thank you very much to the, to the technology uh, yeah. colleagues. Exactly. Next time in Paris. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you and uh, have a very great evening, all of you. <laughs>